we got some rookies that you need to stop sleeping Ooh. on. I don't, look, I'm just going to say this. I love the later rounds in rookie drafts. I feel like that's where the best value is. I love to stash players. You know, you I love to have a nice full taxi squad, guys that, and we do have to be realistic. Not all these guys are going to pan out. That's okay. But be it if you use these rookie picks to draft a player that you want to stash, or if you use them as a commodity to make other moves, I think late round draft picks, they're fantastic to have. You could do a lot of fun stuff with them. We're going to get into our strategy. Yeah what we do with those late round picks and why later but let's get into it nate who is your first rookie that you need to stop sleeping on looking at the show sheet i just want to say automatically i love this this is mm -hmm. fantastic i also want to say had he been in sleeper from the get-go i feel like his adp would be a little bit different i agree as well but uh hey we got lots of age concerns going on that's what i'm hearing from the other people but i'm telling you, you guys stop sleeping on cody schrader Running back out of Missouri. Mike, you're a big fan of Cody Schrader. I'm a big fan of Cody Schrader. Look, I get it. He's going to be 24 years old when he gets drafted. He's going to be 25 years old by the end of his rookie year. Mm. He's not going to be, you know, my running back two, three for the next eight years. Oh, darn it. I, I don't expect any running back to really be even on my team necessarily in the, the next three or four years at this point with how fluid that position is. So if I can get two to three years out of Cody Schrader, even if that's, you know, as a spot starter and just coming up as a flex, maybe playing a couple of weeks a year right now at the ADP of 508, Mike, the 16th running back off the board. I love it because I think Cody Schrader is a really good player. And while he's, Older than most prospects. Hey, there's a, there's a couple other old running backs in this draft class, so we'll see what happens. Um, while he's older, and he's had quite the journey to get to Missouri, where he ended up leading the SEC in rushing. Um, coming from Mike, was it uh, a Division two school? I believe it was. Yes, it was. Uh, yes. He was also a walk on, I believe, and he was the eighth string running back at one point in time. <laughs> I could find out what school he came from if you'd like. Yeah, there you go. He's had quite the journey to get to where he's got, uh, and you know. Teams like that, coaches like that, they like hardworking guys who are dedicated to the craft of football. And Cody Schrader fits the bill there. Um, I definitely think he's going to be drafted, I think, most likely day three because of his age. But he brings together a really good you know, uh, skill set on the ground to run in between the tackles while also having enough acceleration and burst to get outside the tackles as well. And then he's a pretty natural receiver as well. Um, I'm a big fan of Cody Schrader. He was patient behind the line of scrimmage. What do you see on film when you look at Cody Schrader? I think is a really good running back. He's a much older prospect, though. You know, obviously the the sixth year breakout or whatever he has, uh, it's it's his own little story. But he's a good player. He's a hard worker. I think he's going to be a good day three pick for some NFL team. And I think if you can pick him up in the fifth round, you're going to get pretty good value. He played at Division Two Truman State, and right. in 2021 he ran for over 2,000 yards and 25 rushing touchdowns. He was really good this year too. I mean, like against yeah, Georgia. Yeah. Against Georgia, which, you know, 16th best rush defense in the NCAA, had 22 carries for 112 yards and a touchdown, 5.1 yards per carry. Also That's put really up good. 205 yards against Tennessee, who's the 20th best rush defense in the NCAA. And then Ohio State, another top 25 defense, 128 yards and a touchdown. Mike, he was productive against the big guys. You know, it's one of those things where, oh, yeah, he did good at Truman State. He ran for over 2,000 yards. He came up to Missouri in SEC school. Now, if he would have came up and was buried on the depth chart, couldn't get on field and ran for like 600 yards, completely different story. He led the SEC in rushing. Nate, you've always said you like when players level up. He did that. He did it at a yeah. high level. I understand there's age concerns. I want Cody Schrader for one contract. If I'm getting him in the fifth round. And Nate, did you mention that we're using our Dynasty Rewind ADP here? I did not. I just said the ADP. Well, it's the ADP. What? The ADP, we just got to let people know, though, that it's the Dynasty Rio and ADP. And again, if you want to contribute to that, we do mocks daily through our Patreon. He's almost not even drafted right now. The 5'11". Oh, I'm sorry. The 5'08". I was skipping ahead a little bit. Forgive me. The 5'08". Oh, yeah, get your guy, man. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I was down on the sheet too far. Uh, but I, I love this. I want him for one contract. And yeah, you know, the age may be a concern for some people. Maybe some coaches are like, this guy's mature. We could get him in there. He doesn't need as much coaching as a guy who's like 20 years old, 21 years old, something like that. If I want to give you like a kind of fantasy expectation for Cody Schrader, I think maybe like a Zach Moss, Okay. which might not get a lot of people excited, but think about it. If this is a fourth, fifth round running back, I think you're getting a pretty good value because it's tough to get a good running back that's even going to make your lineup at that point. Look, Zach Moss 
probably got himself paid this last season. Oh, I think so. I love Cody Schrader. I'm also a big fan of this next guy we got coming up, Nate. That's Blake Watson from Memphis. Speedy. The DR ADP, the correct ADP, not what I was mentioning before. The 5'11", so he's almost not being drafted right here. This is a freebie at the end of the draft. I absolutely love it. Nate said it right. He's speedy. He has breakaway speed. Now, he's not the most physical back, but he can move some defenders out of the way. He's a really good receiver as well, by the way. These Memphis backs, they show that they can catch the ball. That's not a problem. He's at, now, even though he's not the most physical, I like his vision and his patience between the tackles. When he breaks outside, he, he will also take what the defense gives him. He doesn't try to do too much. He doesn't try to come back, you know, dance around in the backfield, and then it ends up being like a 14, 15 yard loss. We've seen guys with profiles similar to Blake Watson's do things like that. You know, I'm not a big comp guy, Nate. I have a hard time with comps. Yeah admittedly have you watched any blake watson yet a little bit maybe i've watched some blake watson do you have a comp for blake watson this is where i struggle <laughs> in comps oh man you know i think in this in this realm you're thinking more of like a like that's not to necessarily be a, a great comp but kind of incorporate fantasy into it so you know when you're looking at like kind of a fifth round player i don't want to say that blake watson is you know keaton mitchell because i think keaton mitchell has proven to be really really good actually but I think Blake Watson has some of those qualities and is kind of the same value. I do actually kind of like that comp a lot, especially when you consider this is a guy who could end up being an undrafted back or a very late round pick. But given an opportunity, I think he could be a productive back. I like that. 5'11", if you you could get a running back that could be a contributor on your roster, you're absolutely I'll take that. Yeah. For for example, this is an area last year we might have been taking a guy like Chris Rodriguez, who this year could be in for a bigger role to play in the commander's offense. All right, Nate, who do we got up next? We got a tight end here. Look at that. Yeah, got a tight end. We got Mike. It's Penn State tight end. So, uh, you know, those guys usually do pretty well in the NFL. You know what they also usually do? They do usually really well in the NFL combine, and that's what Theo Johnson did. Theo Johnson currently dynasty to real one ADP of 506, Mike, but I'm sure that's going to shoot up with the athletic testing that he had at the combine. We're going to see him into the fourth round, maybe even into the third round if he gets some good draft capital. But let me tell you what. At the tight end six off the board right now, he's going to have to be moving up because he had the second best relative athletic score of all time, Mike, since 1987 when they started doing um, the combine and having all this testing. What happens when you get a guy who's six foot six, 260 pounds, and he runs a four, five, seven, has a 39.5 inch vertical jump, 10 foot, five inch broad jump. So athletic, Mike. And he's coming from a place like Penn State where you know they have some of the top conditioning. They also have really good tight end coaches over there. And while we didn't really see a ton of production out of Theo Johnson, It's college. So he still had 300 yards the last two years. It was a Penn State offense that wasn't really throwing the ball a ton. And while he didn't have a lot of competition out there, there are some other tight ends in that group. If you have a tight end that's really, really athletic and he gets day two draft capital, you have to take a swing on him. And I think right now Theo Johnson is in that realm. And I think he's shown enough to me on film that he's he's a good tight end who just didn't have a lot of volume. You know, I don't think Theo Johnson is you know, going to be the top three tight end in this class based off of film. But when you add in just the the pure athleticism that we saw at the combine, and you saw that on film with the wheel routes, he would run, how he break open the scheme. He's definitely someone with that kind of upside. You got to take a chance on because RAS wants to compare him to Jimmy Graham. Um, Maybe he's just Zach Koontz. I'm not sure. I think he's a good bit better than Zach Koontz. And I think with that kind of testing in the Penn State somewhere in between lineage, he should be a day two pick. So, um, I, I want to take a swing on Theo Johnson if he gets a day two draft capital. If not, and he ends up a day three pick, I'm still probably taking a swing on him probably at this point in the fifth round. Yeah. Um, because, hey, if I can take a fifth round and uh, get a really athletic tight end, you're definitely going to take that uh, shot. So maybe you're rooting for him to get day three draft capital. So maybe people do sleep on him. We'll see. I, I love that. Hey, guys, Bob here dropping by to interrupt your scheduled programming to thank today's trusted partner, Mint Mobile. I don't know about you, but I'm always looking for ways to save money. And it always shocked me to see what I was paying when it came to my wireless bill. 
I couldn't help but think, what am I even paying so much money for? Am I paying for speed, coverage, data, access to 5G, unlimited talk and text, mobile hotspots, you name it. I was paying so much money while Mint Mobile offers all of these features for as low as $15 a month. And I know what you're thinking. It was my first thought too. How can they only charge $15 a month for that much coverage? For starters, they're built on the nation's largest 5G network, and they keep costs low by only selling online. This means no pushy sales rep trying to earn a commission or brick and mortar locations. The cost is great and don't worry, they made switching easy too. This is all thanks to the Mint Mobile app and digital eSIMs that most phones now have. This means you can sign up and activate your phone from the comfort of your own home and start saving today. Switching was a breeze and now I'm saving money while enjoying all the same YouTube videos, streaming NFL games, and listening to podcasts just like I used to. All of this without any drop in video quality, speed, or performance. And the last thing I'll say is this. Big wireless companies want you to think that they're the only option. And quite frankly, that's just not the case. Try mintmobile.com forward slash dynasty rewind the link will be on the screen in the youtube description as well as in the pinned comment below thank you all so much for listening and supporting this brand as much as you do and a huge shout out to our new partners at mint mobile but with all of that said let's get right back to the content you came for all right Nate, let's dive back into my next player and that is tcu tight end jared wiley um, so I finished my scout of Jared Wiley and uh, Amani Bailey, uh, two guys that we had on our scouting sheet. And um, I came away being quite impressed, especially when you consider that right now, keeping in mind, most rookie drafts are only five rounds, but he's currently going at the 609. He's tight end 11. Do you know how big this guy is, Nate? I do not. Tell me. Six foot seven. It's a pretty big guy. This is a guy with a big frame, short hands, and he's got a massive catch radius too because he's got this big arm span. He's six foot seven. In the NFL, he could be a red zone monster. I mean, mm. you put him out there, he could be a decoy too because of how big he is. That opens other guys up. I know that doesn't really help very well in your fantasy stat sheet, but obviously it helps NFL teams to get someone on the field more. Anything can happen when you're on the field. We know that. For his frame too, really good burst for his size after the catch, and he was a lot more elusive than I expected as well. You know, you see these guys and everybody gets obsessed with size. Look, we're all size queens when we play fantasy, <laughs> be it the size of the player or the size of our, you know, points scored or everything like that. We love these big players. But a lot of times you see a guy that's this big playing tight end. They're just very big and lumbering. He's not like that. He has good lateral agility. He can move around a lot better than I expected. I like him a lot. Kind of reminds me of Mo Ali Cox. Just the frame, the way okay. he can plays. I don't know what he's going to be, but at the 609, or in this case, as what would be a UDFA, we'll pluck him off the UDFA waivers, I guess they're called, however they classify it. I'm going to throw him on my taxi squad, let him chill out there for a little bit. He could be on there so I could get rid of Kenny Yaboa, uh, Bryson Hopkins, and Zach Koontz and everybody off oh, of man. my taxi squad, and I could put Jared Wiley on there. I'm actually, uh, Mike, I haven't watched – Jared Wiley yet. Um, I need to. I need, I need to watch him because it sounds like he's intriguing for sure. He definitely is intriguing. It's just the size. The size is one of the things that stands out to you, of course. And there's a lot of times where he also uh, is really good in the seam. He gets like uh, Jatavian Sanders. He gets open mm. better than you would anticipate. And I've said it before about JT Sanders. How do you let a man this large just get wide open? And it's almost like sometimes these Wiley. coaches, they're like, don't, don't cover the tight end. They're not going to do anything with that. And it's like, well, yeah, they are. <laughs> got one of my favorite guys. In I got team. a good guy here, man. So I got five foot eight, 194, Malik Washington out of Virginia. Uh, currently in the DR ADP at the 411, Mike. That is the wide receiver 23 off the board. I just want to point out that Malik Washington, who used to play at Northwestern, Transferred to Virginia this year as a grad transfer. So he played four years at Northwestern. Didn't have incredible numbers there, but his final year at Northwestern, he did see it over 100 targets. Um, he had over 500 yards in his two final seasons there. So had some production there. Went to Virginia and immediately stepped in as their wide receiver one as a transfer. A lot of times I've been excited about these transfer wide receivers and they end up going to the new situation and takes until like their second year to really pull it together and break out. Malik Washington steps right in, goes out there, has 
111 receptions, Mike, for 1,300 yards, almost 1,400 yards, 12.5 yards per reception, and nine touchdowns. Also a 91.1 PFF grade on offense, which is elite. And then if you look at the yards per route run across the entire NCAA, he was 12th in the nation with names up there like Malik Neighbors and Marvin Harrison Jr. and these other big names that we're looking at in the draft. Malik Washington's right up there with those guys. He was very impressive. 100 yards, Mike, in every single game this year, except for the first game against Tennessee, and then week five against Boston College, but he still put up nine receptions for 97 yards and a reception and a reception touchdown. So Malik Washington was consistently the offense for Virginia. He handled that volume very well, um, playing out of the slot and outside, and he's got good hands. He creates separation. He's got some yards after the catch ability. He's a good all-around wide receiver, a little small, but he's thick. And I expect him to get early day three draft capital. I think there might be a chance he sneaks into the third round if there's a team that really likes him. I mean, not the helmet scout, but are we looking at Malik Washington? Maybe he's like the next Dontavian Wicks. And I think Malik Washington is, you know, not, not Dontavian Wicks in the play style, but as that late round wide receiver okay. that has that breakout. I think Malik Washington fits kind of that. He's really good, but I think he's going to be underdrafted for how good he is. Yeah, that I can see, but uh, the play style is completely different. I love Malik Washington. He's a tough little dude, too. I'll say that, you know, we've yeah. talked about players in the past who are big and they just do not give it their all. They don't show any physicality. Malik Washington is the opposite of that. It's almost like he plays harder because he knows he has to. He has something to prove. I love Malik Washington. I want to leave almost every draft that I possibly can with this guy. He's awesome. My last guy, small school guy. Everybody likes these small school players. Dylan Lobby, Dylan Lube, as I like to call him, going off the 505. He's running back 14. Now, here is what is not good about Dylan Lobby. He does not have the burst or pure physicality to be a three down back. However, the very, very good receiving running back, soft hands, and he's a great runner with the ball in his hands after the catch. That's where this guy is going to make his bread and butter. He can be used in a variety of different ways as well. And a lot of people are going to be scared off by him going to New Hampshire. But you know what? This late, the fifth round, I'm going to take a chance on a guy who could make some noise in a training camp. And my comp for him is a guy like Rex Burkhead. I kind of like his play style. I liken it to Rex Burkhead. Sexy Rex, he was a little bit more physical. But at the middle of the fifth round, let's take a shot on a running back with some tremendous upside. That's pretty much it. But Nate, before we go, um, you know, we got a little just bonus discussion here. Late round picks, they could be dark throws. So how do you look to maximize the value of these picks, these later round guys? I like to target tight ends and wide receivers personally, not so much running backs, because if I draft a running back late, I'm hoping they just get a spot start somehow and they make some noise. So like, I'm not going to put on my taxi squad because I'm hoping I can use them at some point in the rookie season, most likely. Um, otherwise I'm probably dropping them. So I, I like to throw those wide receivers and those tight ends in the taxi squad. Cause sometimes they take a year to develop. A guy like Khalil Shakir this year, Mike, you know, he didn't really do too much his first year. And then his second year, he kind of had a breakout year. And now we're excited about him going into th his third year. There's, there's a couple of players like that every draft. That you know, you throw them in your taxi squad, it takes them a year to really get into the offense, and then we're excited about it because there's a free agent, you know, leaving or you know, some kind of opportunity opening up. You no, know, last year I talked about uh, Tyler Scott a good bit as someone to taxi, um, because hey, Darnell Mooney is leaving a free agency. Look, it's gonna happen. Um, unfortunately, they seem destined to bring in some top tier wide receiver talent through the draft as well as maybe free agency. So Tyler Scott, maybe not the best stash at the end of the day, but still he has that chance where you're looking ahead. Okay. This guy, he's not going to do much as a rookie year because he's a late round pick or an undrafted player, but if he makes the team and then this guy who's ahead of him, who looks like most likely to leave in the free agency next year, maybe he has an opportunity then, or maybe it's just a really light core like wide receiver court. Maybe there's just not a lot of players there. And there's just opportunity. That's what how I'm looking at it with these late round picks. You know, what's the path to opportunity? That's the most important thing. Um, but Mike, not just about picking players with these late round picks. And a special part of having these late round picks is you don't have to pick a player with it. It's true. You know, you can use these picks to move around the board. You can move these picks to upgrade your players. If you want to, you know, upgrade from one player to another who's 
really kind of in the same tier for maybe some people, but you just really think that one player is better, maybe you need to throw a third on it to make it happen or a fourth just to make it happen. Also, you know, if you're in this situation where you're at the 206 and the guy you really want is at like the 204, and all you have to do is add an early fourth on top or a, a late third on top to go get your guy, Let's do it. that is where the true value of these late round picks falls because you don't want to miss out on that guy and then see him do well. And then, oh, well, lucky you, you still got whoever you got at the 206, who in, in this instance is worse than whoever you could have got the 204. And then you get, oh, the guy that you picked up at the late third, who you probably cut after your, you know, your next year when you had to do cut downs. So if it's going to be the difference of you getting the guy that you need to make your team better, that's where these late round picks can really come in handy. I love stashing players that get, you know, upside guys. We talked about that. This is where, you know, people like to get trades done. They, they're, I feel like when you're in the first and second round, it takes a lot more to pry those picks away from people. Yeah. The fourth, fifth round, you're like, hey, I want this pick. I'll give you blah, blah, blah. Yeah, whatever. I don't want to make this pick anyway. It's fine. I'll gladly do it. And I just want to bring out to you, I look back through some of my previous drafts, okay? In some of these drafts, I've seen players going in the fourth or fifth round, players who have turned out to be legitimate starters, Ramondre Stevenson, Sam Howell, Isaiah Pacheco, Isaiah Likely. These are guys who were all drafted late. Sam Howell was quarterback three, I believe, at one point during this last (laughs) season, was he not? And you could have flipped him probably for a first-round pick. You most likely could have. So, you know, when people say late-round picks don't matter, this is why I harp on this, I harp on Fab, this stuff matters. These are all things that you can use. You need to use everything at your disposal to make your team better and if it's a late round pick if it's fab if it's whatever that's what you do it personally i don't mind stashing running backs and tight ends uh, tight ends typically depending on the situation take a little bit longer to develop not everybody's sam laporta they're just not so guys might take a few years jake ferguson was a guy that took a while for dalton yeah. schultz the other way and for him to blossom and also there, some quarterbacks in certain situations i'll gladly pluck and, and draft and keep them there as well sam Howell would have been a good example of that and i think spencer rattler will be a good example of that as well. that's all we got for you thanks for listening hey again don't forget check out patreon.com forward slash dynasty rewind i'll see you guys but until next time for nate i'm mike thanks for listening